Hello, everyone. My name is Raymond Lada. I am a spokesperson for Revolution Books, and I want to welcome everyone to our very special program tonight, A Night of Bold Verse. Three Black women poets present their work, and this work is being presented at the bookstore about the world for a radically different world. Uh, our three speakers tonight are Lauren K. Aline, Antoinette Grimm, and Marilyn Nelson. And tonight's program uh, is part of our continuing series at Revolution Books, 60 Defiant Days from Revolution Books, Talks, Dialogue, Performance. In the name of humanity, the Trump-Pence regime must go. These programs are a response. This series is a response, an emergency response to an unprecedented situation that we face. We're facing one of the most dangerous situations in modern history. Fascist regimes threaten to tear the world to pieces. And the most powerful of these monstrosities, the Trump-Pence regime, is marshalling forces to hold on to power, and to consolidate full out fascist rule. And just in the last two weeks, witness what's happened. Trump continues to proclaim that he will not honor the outcome of this election if he's not elected. And he's threatened his fascist thugs to go to polling stations to intimidate, bully, and suppress. In Los Angeles last weekend, the immigration, the federal immigration police launched raids in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego, rounding up immigrants, subjecting them to detention, putting children in cages, deportation. This is the fascist program at work. And then we saw last night at the so-called town hall meeting that Trump uh, took part in. Once again, he supported and gave backing to white supremacist reactionary groups, in this case, QAnon. And then they've been ramming through the nomination of Amy Barrett, Amy Coney Barrett, this Christian theocrat who wants to outlaw abortion, ban gay marriage, and who announced yesterday that she's a climate warming denialist. This is the road, this is the marauding road that these fascists are on. And these programs at Revolution Books, the very different types of events we're having are aimed at deepening people's understanding of what we are confronting, of heightening people's determination to go into the streets and to stop fascism through sustained nonviolent protest and to raise people's sights to the revolution that humanity needs. I encourage people to look at one of our most recent programs in 60 Defiant Days. And that was a dialogue between National Revolution Book spokesperson Andy Z and Yale philosopher Jason Stanley, who spoke on the theme, how fascism works and how to stop it. I would encourage everyone to go to Refuse Fascism dot org and look at the pledge that has been signed by Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, Arturo Farrell, uh, the poet Jessica Kerr Moore, calling on people in the name of humanity. We refuse to accept a fascist America. We will stop a regime that imperils the people of the world and the earth itself. We will take to the streets day after day and call forth others. We demand Trump Pence must go. So that's the background for 60 Defiant Days and what we're doing. And we're having literary events, we're having film showings, we're having dialogues. And then tonight, we're having this very special poetry reading. Uh, our readers, again, are um, Lauren K. Aline, Antoinette Grimm, and Marilyn Nelson. And the format is going to be each of them is going to uh, read and comment for 15 minutes. And then there'll be some conversation among them. And 
perhaps we'll be able to get back to another round of readings. We're very excited about having a poetry event tonight. Um, and, um, and then we encourage you in the listening and viewing audience to send in your comments, your thoughts to the chat, and we'll see what comes in. I'm gonna say a little more a little later about our great needs for funds and your support for this bookstore about the world for a radically different world. I'm gonna introduce our first reader and poet, and that's Lauren K. Aline. Uh, Lauren is from Trinidad and Tobago. Her fiction, poetry, and essays have been published widely, including in The Atlantic, Crab Orchard Press, and Ms. Muse. She is the author of Difficult Fruit, and I think most recently, if I'm right, Lauren Honeyfish, is that right? And um, I'm very excited to announce, we just learned that uh, Lauren was just uh, named a finalist for the Library of Virginia Literary Award. And we send our congratulations to you and we hand the stage over to you as we start our event tonight, um, a night of bold verse, three black women, poets present their work and Lauren, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to Revolution Books, to Ray, to all of you guys, um, to Marilyn for the invitation. I'm excited to read with Antoinette, who I haven't seen in forever, and to speak and take this moment to acknowledge the, um, the dire situation. I speak as a woman, as a Black woman, as a Black immigrant woman, um, and you know, very much embodied uh, and at the crux, I think, of all that is imperiled in America. Um, and so I, I am not a citizen of the United States, and so I cannot vote, but I certainly hope that the folks out there who have that privilege uh, and responsibility certainly use it to, um, you know, bend that arc of justice and drive us toward that more perfect union that is inclusive and welcoming and just and equitable. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is in the voice of Gretel from the story Hansel and Gretel, which I feel I need a little explanation just because it's one of those, as, as a writer, I, I really interact with the world through narrative and through story. And that's one of those stories that just sort of always stuck with me. One, Disney can't do anything with it. There's no wedding, no love story. Um, and also, I just think, you know, what does it mean to, to think about the world through the lens of a young girl? right, who saves herself and her brother. Um, and, and so I'm always sort of invested in, in, in using that, that lens. And, you know, again, story helps us understand the world and we have to keep using the stories, right? And so um, in this poem, Gretel advises America. The story is old. There is safety, then danger, then the illusory ending. There is a person who believes everyone is for the taking, who will make food of you and assume you will comply with no resistance. This is always the mistake. The trick is old. There is no great again, no return to what was for anyone, not the father longing for an unburdened life, not the stepmother clambering toward the dream of ever after she polished beneath her lids for a lifetime. Not for the children who must grow away from innocence one way or another. The moral is this, you already know the spells for survival, your mind's swift magic, the miracle of your hands, love, and all its attendant fire. Um, the other poem I'm going to read is, um, is also published, this that was uh, appeared in Ms. Muse, and um, I was, you know, thinking of just all these ways of like activating old things for coping mechanisms, and I learned um, one weekend a few years ago at a conference about the blazon form, um, a form that sort of basically scanned a woman head to toe and complimented everything about her in poetic form, uh, in simile. And 
you know, with a pussy grabbing possible president, um, that seemed a little leery. <laughs> and so I thought, how do I co-opt that form from objectifying to subjectifying and even more, uh, I think, powerfully revolutionizing. And so this is Anthem for the Beloved, which is ourselves, which is all of us, a blazon. Feet like a mandate, ankles like swords, calves like streets taken back, knees like unpolluted oceans, thighs like a night sty constellated, hips like damn, vaginas like consent, backsides like the perfect pair of glasses, call it hindsight, navels like rebellions, Guts like uncolonized galaxies, breasts like generations, clavicles like cutlasses, shoulders like ancestors, spines like ropes that refuse the lynching, ribs like a binding, backs like holy books burned and rising new from their own ash, necks like revolution, turning, turning, chins like anchors, jaws like justice, mouths like genesis, like evolution, tongues like revelations, noses like bullshit detectors, cheeks like an invitation to the table, eyes like incantations, foreheads like shields, third eyes like a summoning, minds like a table with seats for every vision, hair like our varied and growing multitude, reaching, always reaching. So, not your typical love poem. <laughs> um, so I am the assistant director of the Fierce Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University. I started here in 2016, uh, moved from Iowa to Virginia, um, in August, uh, just before the election, and was here and had my first reading at my new job three days after uh, Donald Trump was elected. And I did not know how I was going to read in front of a room full of people. Um, and I, I just, I was so devastated and so just sort of a puddle. And I was like, you gotta get it together, Lauren, like this is it, you know? And so um, again, a writer, I, the word helps me fortify myself, right? And I, I thought, how can I write my way into something like, I don't know, life again? <laughs> um, and so oddly enough, I, you know, I've been campaigning for uh, the Dems and, and was working on Hillary. And I thought about, I was thinking about symbol, right? Um, that, that pantsuit was such a symbol, right? Pantsuit nations, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I also am a fan of the ode because that's always, I'm like, you know, if something is really horrible, if you find some way to, to find the joy or the possible possibility of joy in it, um, you know, there's a way out of the terrible. And so um, with some research and some, you know, drafting, I came up with uh, ode to the pantsuit. You thought yourself retired, lounging unused in the back of 70s feminist closets or retro thrift shop racks in all your iterations, jackets, shoulder padded, double breasted, collars sculpted into every shape of wing, embracing your namesake boxy or slim legged bottoms, pantsuit, you thought your work was done. You thought to retire having served us well, we women who donned you like armor and strode proudly into spaces too spiked for dresses, too fragile for the curve of leg you held with such ease. You cloaked us with confidence, the cake to every superheroine wanting to kick a glass ceiling in. You were the anti-cute, unflattering, a revolution with functional pockets. Draped in you, unladylike one, we slipped mind first into a world that believed us hollow. How you held our softness secret, shielded our vulnerable with your badass, grab deflector, pussy protector, pantsuit, you stayed with us, evolving as we did into weaponized power suited style, blossoming into separates, daring silk camisoles, frilled blouses, before long skirts, that must have been a blow. But oh, pantsuit, you understood 
Perhaps like so many of us, you thought the battle over, victory if not immediate, at least inevitable. We let our hems up, our guards down. We believed you relic, symbol, symbolic, labeled 2016 the year of your resurrection. We named you a nation and ourselves your ecstatic citizens. We pranced our pantsuit joy. Perhaps like some of us, you always suspected this betrayal. The quirky reenactment turned final battle, the enemy returned hydra-headed, fanged and multitudinous, and you, sweet suit, mere thread and dream against it. Perhaps the two-piece double consciousness of you always knew you might not emerge unbedraggled. Still, I salute you, pantsuit. Vow to dust the dirt from your war-torn seams, pull you on, pull myself through pantsuit up, and remember the truth we always knew. You, pantsuit, are only as powerful as the bodies that bear you. Um, time check, okay. So- Still time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read to a couple of pieces from Honeyfish. Um, and yeah, I don't know. This was one of my, I have two self portraits. Um, what's the word? Um, relevant self portraits in Honeyfish. And um, one is more, you know, bold than the other. I'll, I'll read them together because again, we, we go through, you know, these take a toll on, on our psyches and, these these times, and I think um, you'll sort of get where where they are. Self portrait with neo Nazi demonstration. Um, I was a visiting professor at the University of Leipzig in 2015, and um, you will pretty much hear the story in this poem. Just like that, the day is black and blue, bruised with hate. Just like that. My skin, black as fine leather, stretches so tight I might tear into bright black ribbons. See the flag, spent and flaccid, the windless black, red, and gold clutched in a fist that I fear will name my black face dirt and land. And just and so, just like that, plans fade to black. A sunlit walk home folds flat into a taxi's steel skin, the black seat holding my body upright. See the street draped in black uniforms, the shrill blue shout of sirens, the march of black draped demonstrators, faces set toward the sun in rows of black sunglasses. I want to shoot something to become a black grizzly and claw someone's throat. What I mean is I want to be black and brave, but today I'm not just like that. Self portrait with burning crosses. And this is set in Dubuque, Iowa one year later. There isn't enough water to make a mirror Enough light to give back the faces wearing night like armor. I've got nothing to hold on to in this white ass town with its white ass worries where someone decides to ignite America into some again burning greatness. I'm in the capital talking poetry and witness when I read the news and try to put out the flames that crawl across my skin, forget it, but my tongue tastes like ash. My hands wisp into smoke hold nothing but history. Fury explodes bright and without mercy, I become the burning. Who struck the match? Who pulled out this white hood, this fiery robe, a student? That woman in the bank with the frosted hair and glasses? The brown toothed old man who shuffles down Main Street every morning at eight? Was it the surly couple across the street or the one who smiles wide and distant at once? Was it a lone wolf or a gang of pimpled teenage boys regurgitating the diet of Fox News and hate they've been fed their whole lives? I am a woman with skin that summons crosses and flame, which is to say I am always burning, which is to say I do not have enough tears to put myself 
out. I live in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I also attend the University of Virginia where I was starting um, in August of 2017. And Charlottesville happened, <laughs> um, right? And yeah, August, Charlottesville after Derek Walcott. In one corner, the first match hisses and soon, a chorus of light answers. Someone shouts now and the bright beast stirs, begins its booted many-legged march. Someone raises an anthem, blood and soil, hungry how it swells, feeds, roars. Fists of flame snarl the air and spits snakes of smoke. Underfoot, the black earth shudders. Mute, immutable, trees bend with invisible weight. Above, the black and weary sky gathers its army of stars. And I think I will um, just read one more poem, short poem four. And just sort of thinking about, you know, what do poets, what can we do? I'm so sorry, hold on, let me try to find this page. It disappeared on me, here we go. Uh, and part of what it means, I think, to engage in this work of social justice and equity and just striving for a better America where we can all be safe is um, paying homage and remembering the lives that are taken as a result of it, that are lost. And this is a poem, Heaven, for Sandra Annette Bland. Where does a black girl go when her body is emptied of her? And her wild voice, where does it sing its story when the knots of history make a grave of her throat? What of her future, blue broken, unmade, her name, say it, Sandra, unhoused, her dreams and memories lost to their source. Where does a black girl's love go when her heart is snapped shut as a cell door, the key out of reach as any justice? And what gift is lost when a black girl is made of body, her light dimmed into shadow, gone? How many angels weep when a black girl is torn into wings? And I'll stop there. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Lauren, for that very powerful reading. And uh, I'm going to introduce our next um, poet, and that is Antoinette Brim. Antoinette is, th is the author of three collections of poetry, These Women You Gave Me, Icarus in Love, and Psalm of the Sunflower. Antoinette Brim is a Cave Canem Foundation Fellow, a recipient of a Walker Foundation Scholarship to the Fine Works, our Fine Arts Works Center, and she is a uh, Pushcart Prize nominee. She's also a professor of English and uh, a printmaker and collage artist. So uh, multivarious interests and uh, pursuits and achievements. So we're very happy to have Antoinette with us and uh, she'll begin her presentation of poems and commentary. Thank you so much um, for having me. You're doing uh, God's work here um, with, with um, all of these um, opportunities for people to get together and process what's going on and to make a stand. Um, I want to say thank you to um, Marilyn for um, sharing the stage with Lauren and I. Uh, of course, we stand in awe and our hearts, you know, are, are so big whenever you're in the room. And I want to say to my sister Lauren, whoa, you knocked my socks off. I was breathless and I'm blinking back tears here. Um, you know, but uh, I'm going to try to catch my breath. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So um, I'm going to read primarily from um, my new collection that I'm working on, um, which is uh, very much in its fledgling stages. But before I do that, um, and I will read a couple of things from um, some of my other books. Um, when we when we were all called together um, to do this um, and the topic of what type of theme might we um, want to pursue with our readings, my heart um, just went to all the, the women, the mothers that are out there and everything um, that they're going to. So I'm gonna start with a poem um, from my book, Icarus in Love. Um, and it's called Raising the Temple at 4 a.m. And I'm just gonna read an excerpt of it. So it begins with two um, epigraphs. One, um, a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile. The moment a single man contemplates it bearing within him the image of a cathedral. And then the second one, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The time before daybreak is the calm before battle, before the world demands the face of hope and the eyes of attention be turned its way. I recall David, whom God did not allow to build the temple because he was a man of war, because he had shed so much blood. I resolve to be a woman of peace today. Knowing that it will be hard to enter the world with only a few smooth stones and the God of my youth. Solomon spared no expense for the temple, even to the point of paying its costs with 20 cities in the land of Galilee. The earth remembers wars and loves the sons and daughters it holds close. I swallow the bitterness of coffee, smooth and unsweetened. I hear the distant voices of my sons, the call of my daughter. I go to them with a step imbued with the surety of motherhood, a sweet and daily martyrdom. I offer them comfort against the morning, clothing against the elements, and food to fend off their newly aroused hunger. I recall Solomon, for whom wisdom was the principal thing. I pray I have raised a temple of refuge and kindness in which to shelter them. Brianna Taylor is dead. It's odd how soon, how early dissolves into late, into leaving, into distant dark, where we sleep, blown outside ourselves, dispersed matter, a stone's throw away from the vacuum that devours flesh and spits out spirit. Blues haiku, down so low, don't think I can get up. Down so low, don't believe in up. So this next poem um, came to me because often I teach the narrative of Frederick Douglass, but I love the narrative so much because there's so many fabulous lessons in it. But um, there is one particular um, section of the narrative where um, Freddie, as he's called at that time, is sent to the slave breaker, Covey. And uh, some of you might remember this. So he gets there and Covey is so brutal. He actually does break Frederick. Um, but then Frederick gets sick and, and, and Covey abuses him so much that he overbreaks him, he unbreaks him and Frederick fights back. And it's at that moment when he fights back, um, after it's all said and done, he says, 
he ceased to be a slave at that time, that although the outside still resembled a slave on the inside, he was no longer a slave and he knew there would come a time when the outside would match the inside. So um, when I thought about how I might want to handle that in poetry, I knew that um, the, the narrative handles it so beautifully that, you know, I didn't need to touch it from, from that aspect. So I thought about Hughes, who is one of the slaves who actually witnesses this happening. And it's such a profound moment. So I'm gonna read the epigraph um, that comes from the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Um, and this is of course in Frederick Douglass's voice. My resistance was so entirely unexpected that Covey, the slave breaker, seemed taken all aback. This gave me assurance and I held him uneasy, causing blood to run. Mr. Covey soon called out to Hughes for help. Hughes. Your thumbs hook themselves into belt loops threaded with frayed rope. You rock to and fro on ball and heel, dusty feet on dry ground. You sass back. My master ain't send me here to whip no man, you declare. You leave the threshing floor and flail. Watch dust fumes bellow and burp. Mop your brow, then throw a stone. Morning dove song out of time. Bless this bliss. Two men doing what men do, bleed and curse each other's God. O oh, sinking sun, set a flame, Hillsboro to Cordova for all our sakes. So, Um, my mother was a singer and one of the things that, um, one of the, uh, I guess I should say album sets that was playing in my house all of the time was Porgy and Bess. Um, and if everyone knows the, the great aria, um, Summertime, which was one of my mother's audition songs. So I grew up hearing that over and over again. Um, then, you know, as, uh, you know, as an older woman, I got to thinking about that because I was, I was saying, you know, I want to hear that again. So I downloaded it and I was listening to it and singing along. And then I thought to myself, George Gershwin wrote this and he put these words in these other people's mouths, right? In these black people's mouths. And I wondered what Bess would say to Gershwin about his work of art. And this is what I came up with. Bess to Gershwin. For us, it spill out in song. At first, hushed as old men's sorrow, then thunder, rolling like a hurricane in summertime. For you, what it be like to find say so in the wide open jaws of black faces, white teeth gnashing out. The, old, the age old mourn and moan to a white God so high up you gotta holler to be heard over the wind. What you know about what's for keeps, what you know about wanting and what be gone, gone, gone. What you know about having plenty of nothing, you tell me what wounds gonna bleed when lies blew the air. You tell me how to pray all the day, pray to keep the devil away, keep from fretting about hell. What you know about rot gut grief or how to undust the happy? Tell me, what is necessarily so? In the morning time, evening time, summertime, winter time, you telling me sing, laugh and dance for you. All you know is we're gonna take it up, grip it, smooth it, soothe it, 
into song. We're going to take it up, even walk it across the river, no ways tired. We already know it takes a long pull to get there. We already know it takes a long pull to get there wherever you're getting to. You know, I don't go out very often, um, but when it becomes necessary and I do go out, it always strikes me how many businesses that were are no more. And I wonder about those people and I wonder about their livelihoods and I wonder what they're doing now or how they're doing or if they're doing. This is a poem I wrote some time ago, but unfortunately it's still relevant. Kmart on Asher is closing. We are vultures clawing through what remains when retail dreams die. We do not stop to consider where these folks will shop when everything is gone to the bare walls. We do not savor our bargains. We dig for more and more until hangers litter the floor like bones picked clean. We do not speak. We do not smile at cashiers whose fear can be measured in final markdowns. Um, so just have two more pieces. Um, this poem is the title poem um, from uh, the collection that I'm working on now, America's Rorschach Test. And so the Rorschach Test is this famous um, ink blot test and the ink blot um, is kind of ambiguous and you look at it and say what you see there. And then the analyst um, makes some type of uh, determination about your psychological health based on how um, you um, respond to these ink blots. It's a psychological test. America's Rorschach test, blots one through seven. One, beaded cornrows click, barely bigger than her sign. Red Summer 2020. Two, on the playground, Margaret calls me African Black Black. I'd rather sticks and stones. Three, Miss Kindergarten teacher says, you're an asset to your race. Let's gentrify your dreams. Four, Uninformed reform, medicine is poison. Take this now or wait. Five, every day, a climb up, a thorned honey locust. Six, thoughts and thinking thoughts, sending and praying prayers, mounting body count. Seven, flashbang grenades, cherry blossoms shudder, weep pink petals. This last one is a duplex. Um, it's called Black Mama's Praying. Black mamas stay on their knees praying, cursing the lies folks tell about how the world don't need you. The world don't need you is a lie folks tell themselves when they step over blood gelled black and slick. Folks step over black blood gelled and slick to get on with things, don't bring bones to the cemetery. Bones in the cemetery hear the prophecy. Together, bone to bone, tendons and flesh, skin. 
bone to bone, tendons and flesh, skin together, four winds breathe into these slain that they may live. Breathe four winds into these slain that they may live. Calling forth prophecy is no light work, no. But for Joshua, the sun stood still, the moon stopped. Black mamas, stay on your knees, praying, praying. Thank you. Well, thank you, Antoinette. And um, we are very grateful for, again, another powerful, lyrical and beautiful presentation. And um, when you said at the start of your reading uh, that you feel very moved to be in a situation, in a setting where we can take a stand and process what's going on, your poetry is helping us to process what's going on. And I want to move now to our next poet. And Give me one second, Raymond. I'm going to just stop my video for a second and give my cat some food because he's sitting here meowing and he'll get louder if I don't do something about it. Tell me two steps away. Okay. So um, that while our, you're this is proof. This is proof to our audience that we are live and unrehearsed here for this event of our 60 Defiant Days from Revolution Books, Talks, Dialogue, and Performance in the Name of Humanity, the Trump-Pence Regime Must Go. So we're waiting on uh, Marilyn Nelson, the very acclaimed uh, and highly accomplished poet, uh, to bring us her presentation tonight. And uh, we've heard from Lauren K. Aline, and we've heard from Antoinette Grimm, and uh, the cat lover is back uh, on stage. Uh, we're so delighted to have uh, Marilyn Nelson uh, with us. I want to introduce her formally. We had a little informal uh, introduction just before. Um, Marilyn is a three-time finalist for the National Book Award. She is one of America's most celebrated poets, period, exclamation point. And uh, she is the author uh, or translator of 17 poetry books for adults and children, five chap books. And in 19, oh, excuse me, in 2014, she published a memoir uh, that was named uh, one of NPR's best books of 2014. And that was How I Discovered Poetry. And her critically acclaimed books for young adults include the memorable and beloved A Wreath for Emmett Till. So we are very honored to have Marilyn with us tonight. And uh, I hand the stage over to you, Marilyn. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be reading here with my sisters. Um, and uh, the problem is reading at the end and you, know, you feel like you have to live up to somebody else. You guys are really good. I was really moved by both of your poems. Thank you for that. And um, so about mine, I'm going to say that um, I don't write about the current moment that's not what I'm called to do. I have been writing about history for a long time. And I just yesterday had a conversation about a new project that's going on here in Connecticut called Witness Stones, in which towns in Connecticut do research and find the names and what they can find of the histories of people who were enslaved in these towns. And then they're making um, little bronze plaques with names of these enslaved people and the stones that will be um, installed in various places like around the town greens and things like that. And um, I 
think the program started in Guildford and West Hartford, but it's moving now, it's growing. And again, it's called Witness Stones. And um, I am just really touched by the idea of Witness Stones. I, uh, this is um, based on um, a project that happened several years ago in Berlin, Germany, in which um, ap um, apartment buildings have plaques uh, at the entrance with the names of the Jewish families who lived there and were taken away during the Third Reich. And it's, it's incredibly moving to walk into an old apartment building and see these names and dates in front of you. Um, so I've been thinking about the movement now of remembering names, say the names of Sandra Bland and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Michael Brown and Laquan McDonald and so on and so on. It's impossible to say all of their names. There are so many of them. And um, what history does is one of the things it can do is to record names and to remember also people who were lost to injustice, whose names are not remembered. So I'm going to read as many poems as I can fit in to this period. Um, poems which name names of people who were victims of injustice in the past of the United States. Um, and I'm going to read, I think I'm trying to get my phone to work here. Um, from, I think three books, a few poems from each of three books. Um, the first book is called The Meeting House. Ta -da! It, uh, it was written to celebrate the um, 350th anniversary of the first congregational church of Old Lyme. And um, I have belonged to this church for several years and um, was asked if I would write some poems about the history of the church to celebrate its history. And I was given all of the historical documents and learned a lot. I'm gonna read some poems uh, about people in Lyme, Connecticut in the 18th century and remember their names. This first poem is called Me Jane. And the one little bit of information is that in the 18th century, people bought the pews in the churches so that if, the, if you were a wealthy person, you bought the pews in the front of the church and the pews became less expensive uh, farther back in the church. So this is Me Jane, Lyme, Connecticut, 1729. Two members in good standing of the church record and sign a business transaction. In consideration of the sum of 25 pounds, one mulatto girl of three years old called Jane to have and hold, possess and enjoy as, as his own proper estate forever during her natural life. Two members who have seats in the front pews. This is someone else in the 18th century in Connecticut as elsewhere in the country, you didn't have more than one name. This is a poem about Arabella, Lyme, Connecticut, 1755. 
Timothy Mather Jr. drafts his will in 1755 at 74. To Sarah, he leaves one third of his farm and the Negro woman for Sarah's natural life. She'd inherited the Negro woman who'd raised her and her sister and brothers with their father, the widowed minister. When Sarah married Timothy, whatever she owned by law became his. For years, he's owned Sarah's almost mother. When he dies, Sarah will own her herself. If the Negro woman outlives Sarah, Timothy dips his quill and writes, she shall live with either of my children she chooses. When she can no longer work, it is my will that my son Joseph shall maintain her at his own cost for the rest of her natural life. Arabella. This is Warwick. And the one informational note here is a, a word Ngombe in the poem, which is Swahili for cow. Warwick. Mary Noyes Eli, 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 Mary Noyes Eli, Last Will and Testament, Lyme, Connecticut, 1769. Twice widowed Mary Ely, 64, being sound of both mind and memory, writes, my Negro Warwick shall be free after I decease to be his own man to all intents and purposes whatsoever. Left to her in her second husband's will, Warwick has served Mistress Ely for 40 years, faithful as a shadow, her trusted friend. But then that Ngombe lives to be 88. Those are uh, 18th century. I switch now to a different century, 19th century New York. Um, this is a book called My Seneca Village about um, a village that was founded in Upper Manhattan in 1825 uh, when a white far farmer decided to sell some of his land to um, African Americans who were already free. Ugh, where's my note? Excuse me, I had a note of what poems I wanted to read. Um, the the village lasted for about fifty seven years and was destroyed when the city uh, decided that it needed a park. So. Uh, this village, Seneca Village, was destroyed in the creation of Central Park in um, 1850, 52 or 57. I'm going to again read uh, poems that have names in them. This is uh, a poem. I used names from the census records of Seneca Village and used the names and descriptions of the residents of Seneca Village um, to illustrate what was going on in the village and in New York. Um, so this is uh, a woman named Diana Harding who uh, owned an orchard in, in uh, Seneca Village. It's dated 1826. And uh, the only little note is a, a codicil is an addition to a will. Uh, after the will's written, you add a PS, you change your mind, okay. Saplings. 
Diana Harding, 1826. Freed by a miraculous codicil, I find myself the owner of one me. Two slightly swampy lots, one deep well, one one room palace, an opportunity. In honor of generations denied the right to roots, I plant saplings. The future will harvest the fruits. Ah, uh, let's see, where am I? Reading quickly. This um, poem has several, uh, two names, three names in it. Um, one of the women who lived in this village was a little bit older than many of the others. And I decided she would be the hairdresser and that she would be the carrier of news and gossip for the village. And her name was Sarah Matilda White. Um, this poem takes place in 1831, which was the year of Nat Turner's rebellion in Virginia. And I'm just imagining that word has traveled to New York. And uh, let's see what else. These are her, she has her own opinions. She, I wrote, I wound up writing several poems in her voice and she kept surprising me. She's not at all like me. She, she's different, she's herself. This is called Skyland, Sarah Matilda White, 1837. Elizabeth, that bump looks good on you. Don't blush, honey. Love is a joy to share. Now, what are we doing today with that mop of hair? Sit on down. I'll fetch warm water and shampoo. This week, shag bark nut oil with peppermint, mortar and pestle and I are on a quest to find which combinations work the best, kettle by kettle of crushed oil and scent. You heard about Jane Bolden? Such a shame. Lean back but she was lustful to the end, acted like every man was her boyfriend. Sometimes I was tempted to call her out of her name. Pat dry while I heat the oil. You heard about that Nat Turner that led slaves to rebel? For two days, whites in Virginia lived in hell on earth like us, I hear. Yes, mad, no doubt thinking justice means turning the tables around, showing the cruel no mercy. That makes sense by the natural logic of experience, but it ain't the teaching my mama passed down. All right, Elizabeth, cornrows again? You're too tender-headed, girl. Try not to flinch. 45 they killed, for which hundreds were lynched. Yes, he was a hero, a man among men. He was hanged, flayed, and quartered. They cut off his head. Maybe God spoke. Maybe madness played a part. But I believe vengeance harms the avenging heart. Was he right or wrong? Ask the future. Ask the dead. All done. Tell Obadiah to watch his back. Thanks. Have a nice day. Yes, that's on my list of things to ask when I'm called to my rest in that sky land where everybody's black. Uh, let's see. Maybe. No, I am, let me cut a few out of my plan. This is um, 
Nancy Morris, who was identified as a widow in 1838. Um, this is called Conductor. When did my knees learn how to forecast rain and my hairbrush start yielding silver curls? Of late, a short walk makes me short of breath and every day begins and ends with pain. Just yesterday I was raising my girls. Now I'm alone and making friends with death. So let the railroad stop at my back door for a hot meal. What do I have to lose? The Lord has counted the hairs on my head and made a little space under my floor. All I ask of life is to be of use. There'll be time to be careful when I'm dead. Birth is a one-way ticket to the grave. I've learned that much slowly over the years, watching my body age. <coughs> Excuse me. Time is a thief and what we give away is all we can save. So bring on the runaways. I know no fear. Let life have meaning if it must be brief. Um, reading from a book called Miss Crandall's School for Young Ladies and Little Misses of Color, which was a collaboration with um, Elizabeth Alexander. We wrote poems about the girls who were students in the school founded in, I believe, 1835 by Prudence Crandall in Putnam, Connecticut, Canterbury, Connecticut. It was founded in 1831 in Canterbury, Connecticut. It was a girls' school. Prudence Crandall, a young white Quaker, um, opened the school with the uh, financial help of the people in, in the town of Canterbury. And um, halfway through the first year, a uh, black girl who was a servant in uh, one of the houses in the town asked whether she could sit on, on some of uh, Miss Crandall's lessons and Prudence Crandall said yes. And uh, as soon as this girl started attending lessons, the parents of the other girls took their girls home, the town took its money back, the state of Connecticut passed a law against opening a school that would educate African-American uh, children. Prudence Crandall was found guilty of breaking the law. She had to spend time in jail, blah, 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 blah. It was a ter terrible scandal, but she is now the official heroine of the state of Connecticut. And, but no, there are several books written about her, but none written about the girls. And this is a poem about the first girl to arrive in Canterbury. The first, I missed one step. Prudence Crandall closed the school after all of this. And then she opened it as a school for black girls. And that's why she's a heroine. She said, forget you, I don't need your children in this school. This is gonna be a school for black girls. And girls came from all up and down the Eastern seaboard to be educated. There were about 14, 15 young teenage girls in Prudence Crandall schools, school briefly. It's an absolutely fascinating story. This was the first girl who arrived. Her name was Anne Eliza Hammond. And this is how she was received in Canterbury. This is just called Miss Ann Eliza Hammond. I brought here in a bag between my breasts money from mama's friend who had bought herself, then saved enough by working without rest to free four friends. This woman gave me her wealth of carefully folded dollars so I could take Miss Crandall's course of study. And within a week of my arrival, I was summoned to appear in court. The judge ruled I'd have to pay a fine, depart, 
or be whipped naked. Honey, the first white fool that thinks he gonna whip me better think again. Touch me and you draw back a nub, white man. I ain't paying and I'm staying. People's dreams brought me to this school. I'm their future in a magic looking glass. That judge and the councilman can kiss my rusty black. I think I might have time. I might have used my 15 minutes, but I might have time to read two very short poems. May I do that? You absolutely can and must. <laughs> Thank you. These are these are also names. They're not. Well, they're names we need to always remember to speak. Um, okay. This is a name that's implied, not named in the poem. Uh, but it's it's uh, this is a poem called How I Discovered Poetry. It's a kind of a memoir of my life during the 50s uh, when I was a child between four and, and uh, 14. Um, so it's everything from a child's point of view, how a child understands what's going on in the larger world. And this is a, a poem about Rosa Parks refusing to get off the bus. It's called Making History, 1955. Somebody took a picture of a class standing in line to get, a, to get polio shots and published it in the weekly reader. We stood like that today and it did hurt. Mrs. Liebel said we were making history, but all I did was squinch up my eyes and wince. Making history takes more than standing in line believing little white lies about pain. Mama says first Negroes are history. First Negro telephone operator, first Negro opera singer at the Met, first Negro pilots, first Supreme Court judge. That lady in Montgomery just became a first by squunching up her eyes and sitting there. And this is the last one I'll read. You'll recognize the unspoken full name. It's an, another 1955 poem. It's called Mississippi. Uh, and it's, um, we went every Thanksgiving to have Thanksgiving dinner with my aunt Charlie in Omaha. So it's on the road to Omaha. Over the river and through the woods for miles of four lane highways slowed by blowing snow through towns named for long vanquished Indians to Aunt Charlie's house in Omaha we go. Hypnotized by the rhythm of the chains I eat a sandwich passed from the front seat where mama and daddy are talking about a boy named Emmett. Jennifer whispering to her doll crosses the line between her side and mine. And when I poke her just a little bit, she howls as if it hurts out of sheer spite. Behave. Lost again in the inwardness of thought and my five senses. I add to my list, thank you for not stationing us in Mississippi. I should probably have said that my dad was in the service and we not being stationed in Mississippi was a, was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay, a moment of pause and reflection and appreciation for, again, a very beautiful and powerful uh, recitation of your work. And I think through uh, tonight and hearing from our three poets, 
um, it's really been, I have to say, uh, a tribute to the power of the spoken word and uh, what the poet can do to retrieve history and to bring us into the present. Um, I wanted to ask um, Marilyn, since you just read uh, from your work, and I'd like to bring uh, our other poets in, uh, but before I ask my question, uh, I wanna bring the audience in. Uh, we may have some late comers, late viewers. Uh, tonight, we're having a very special uh, program, a literary event as part of our series, our emergency series, 60 Defiant Days from Revolution Books, Talks, Dialogue, Performance in the Name of Humanity, The Trump-Pence Regime Must Go, We Refuse a Fascist America. And uh, our three poets tonight um, are Marilyn Nelson, whom you just heard from, uh, Antoinette Brim, and Lauren K. Aline. Uh, each of them read. Uh, and um, again, this was very, very defiant, very beautiful, lyrical, and uh, memorable. Uh, this is a very special event, as I said. I also want to uh, let the audience know that um, all of the books by our authors are available at the Revolution Books online um, platform. That's revolutionbooksnyc.org. And our poets have on their own without any prompting and prodding for me held up their books. So please hold up each of you, hold up uh, one of your titles, one of your books so that people can see them. You know, we're doing the programs virtually. I'm at home. I don't, I, I, I'm not at the store to display the book. So I count on uh, our authors here. And um, all of those books can be gotten at revolutionbooksnyc.org. I urge you uh, to visit that platform and uh, to get these books. Um, so uh, we're gonna have a little conversation now and uh, wanna bring all three of our poets together. Um, Sorry. There's a little. There's a little. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Rako, can you hear me? We're having just a technical problem. Uh, this is our virtual program, and this comes with the territory. Um, we're trying to uh, learn how to do these well, and everything went without a hitch, I have to say, the poetry readings that we just heard from. Um, so um, let's open the conversation. Can you hear me, uh, my, uh, our guests? Can you hear me fine and see me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, because there's some, something has happened on my screen, but that doesn't matter. So, um, uh, you know, uh, Marilyn, you know, you started your, 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 presentation by saying, well, I don't, you know, I'm not so much speaking of the current moment, I'm speaking more historically. Uh, on the other hand, one couldn't be, <laughs> you know, one couldn't, you know, one couldn't uh, avoid the, uh, the fact that what you're speaking of, of historically is very much of the moment. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I'd like to hear you kind of like, you know, hold forth a bit on, you know, how you see this you know, historical reclamation project that you're engaged in. Um, I thought the uh, the description of the witness stones was very emblematic of the whole project of what you've undertaken here. So we are in a moment when the whole history of this country is being re-examined, being called out, the whole you know, foundation of this country on slavery, on genocide against Native Americans, on territorial conquest and theft. And you're going back into this history to reclaim the lives and the humanity of those who have not been heard from. And there are the lessons within this. So I just thought that this relationship between the history and the very um, detailed and delicate, you know, reclamation that you've done, the stories that you've told, and how that actually does bring us to the present. At least oh, that's how I heard it, Marilyn. So maybe you could you know, say a little mm -hmm. more about the interplay. Uh, well, yes, that's certainly true. The, 
um, history offers a, a, a dynamic and valuable view of the present. Um, history teaches us who we are. It teaches us where we are and where, where we've come from, how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. Uh, but um, the history that's being re-examined now by the larger audience of America is not a new history. It's just that it's been ignored by a large part of the population. We've known about it. Native Americans have known about it. It's, this, is, this, this is the truer history of America. Um, we were taught di a dishonest history, a mythical history that only told a, a small part of the truth and what's happening now. And I understand that it must be painful for people who believed the lies of the myth to have to suddenly look at true history and recognize that the, the, the earth that we are all singing is so beautiful the spacious skies that we look up to looked down on earth that was soaked in blood. And we ignored that. We've been taught not to recognize that. And it's just that now it's not possible for a while at least to ignore the truth of our history, but there have been times earlier the, when the larger part of the population has seen a, a, a truer truth about America in the 30s, for example. Um, uh, there, were, there were many people who were seeing poverty, for example. You only have to study American literature to see that um, there have always been people who've seen the truer history, in my opinion, uh, in, in my opinion, and um, it comes and goes, and we just have to hope that more people stay awake, and it's kind of as if, you know how the northern lights move across the sky like a big scarf? And it's kind of like for a little while, the scarf is raised and we look and we can see, but then it comes down again. <laughs> we have to remember what we've seen during those periods of clarity. I'm sorry, I'm blathering here, I tend to. Blather. No, far, <laughs> far from it. I do wanna, I, I quite agree with you that this is, uh, suppressed truth. It's not just another narrative of history. It is what's the actual reality of this society and country. And that's what there's a battle over right now. And in fact, we know Trump is, you know, is is going after the 1619 project. You yeah, know, he's, yeah. he's actually saying that schools in California will be denied federal funding if they use the 1619 project, which is telling the truth of, you know, the slave foundations of this country. Uh, they'll be denied funding and, um, you know, also attacking critical race theory. So there's a real battle and it's getting concentrated. And I'm thinking about your witness stones over the battle over monuments in, in yes. this society as well. So I think this is quite true. I wanted to bring Lauren and, and Antoinette into the discussion. And, um, you know, we were talking about going back in time history. Uh, Lauren, um, Lauren, in one of your opening poems, um, you know, you're traveling around the world. You're uh, you're in Germany. You know, you're in Charlottesville. You're in other. Uh, how has you know the 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 you know the the ways in which you have you know processed the world you know been shaped by being in the world in different uh, moments of history? And you're drawing some threads here. 
between the, I'm not going to re, 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 rehearse <laughs> no. what you did, but I'd like to hear you speak a little Thank more you. about how you um, see, you know, we kind of did that going back in time to the Ford and you're looking at a larger global picture and capturing right. that in your poetry. Am I Absolutely. right? Or? Absolutely. I mean, uh, as I sort of opened with as a, as a an immigrant black female from a, an island in the Caribbean with a majority black population that, you know, this big on a global stage um, and moving around in the world, I feel as though um, that's sort of what this collection is thinking about, right? Um, you know, I am fascinated by the encounter between bodies and space, you know, and place um, in the in sort of the under the auspices of history, right? The histories that our bodies sort of hold that we have personally, but then when you go into a place, whatever history that space holds is what you encounter, right? And so, um, you know, to be a black person in America is a thing I learned to be in America. <laughs> Right. Um, and, you know, I was reading one of my journals from from Germany where I was like, I've become American because now I'm thinking of myself as a black person as I'm in Germany, where, you know, again, there were anti immigrant riots and this neo Nazi demonstration. And so, um, you know, one of the sort of disheartening things is certainly the way that anti blackness and white supremacy has has spread you know it, it's it is a global phenomenon it's happening everywhere in all of these nefarious overt covert uh ways and um that is something that this black body encounters in these various spaces right but um but i also kind of try to take heart in and i hope the blazon sort of reflected that as well is um we are a people that persist and certainly um we are resilient and always keep coming up with these new innovative unnecessary ways on all of these spheres and planes to, um, again, I think of Antoinette talking about that moment with very jealous to reclaim personhood, right? To, to, uh, to insist on subjectivity and resist objectification and to, to be. And so I think, um, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of some of the things I think about. That blazon was fabulous. I just want to say that before we go. <laughs> Thank you. Really wonderful. Uh, Antoinette, um, and then I want to open it up to the three of you in, you know, making further comments. Um, uh, Antoinette, um, the poem about Bess speaking to George Gershwin, mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, Hear you deconstruct that a little more. I thought that was a very provocative and, uh, you know, it's a very creative work. And, you know, it, it, it does kind of speak to the ways in which people are grappling with, you know, what is authentic and the voices that are heard and that can speak. And also the role of art, that, that the artist is able, I mean, the artist is able to, because he or she is an artist, to to go places that others can't to capture experience. So how do you see that? I thought this was, you know, I'd like to hear a little more about this. The Well, um, the, the funny thing about being a poet is that nothing is ever just what it is, right? So the moment that, you know, um, you know, I guess it was, what is it, Audra? I can't remember her last name. She was on Broadway. They had done the revival. McDonald, of, Audrey McDonald. There you go. Um, had done the revival. Uh, and I must have seen it on TV or something and then thought, oh, wow, I remember that. And uh, so I, I'm listening to the new cast singing and all of that. And so then I said, well, I want to know a little bit more about this. And then I was like, wait a second, you know, Gershwin, you know, is a, a guy from New York. What in the world, it, what, what made him think that he could do this, right? That he had the agency to do it um, or the wherewithal to do it. And so I did a little research. He went down to South Carolina, I think it was Charleston for a year, listened to how people talked and wrote this, um, you know, this opera. And, um, you know, I, I just thought about who's, 
who gets to tell the story? I guess getting a little Hamilton, uh, you know, who, who gets to tell the story and was that his story to tell? And uh, I thought about the fact that black people are portrayed um, oftentimes through the lens of societal mores and the way other people think we talk, the way other people think we think, the way you know other people um, encounter us, so to speak. And, and I thought, you know, what would she just say to him? You know, because the bottom line is when she was given my, you know, fictional best was given that script, she had to take it up. She had to do it, right? So when I walk into a room and someone um, clothes me in their own expectations, mm. I still have to wear those clothes, right? No matter you know how much they are ill-fitting or if I want to shed them, I'm still there clothed in their own expectations. And so of course, we're gonna take it up we're going to do what we have to do. We're going to either try to correct it or whatever, but we still have to deal with that. And I think ultimately that's what best decides. We know, you know, you know, we're going to take it up and we're going to not do, we're not going to be tired, which goes back to what, you know, um, Lauren was saying too, is that, uh, you know, we, we, we make something out of ourselves, uh, out of our situations and reclaim our own personhood. And um, I think those beautiful songs in the mouths of those beautiful black actresses was a way of reclaiming personhood. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to, if, if, um, if, if Reiko can hear me, can you hear me, Reiko? I can. <laughs> I just want to just keep me posted if any uh, comments come in, you know, that we might want to share with our, our poets. All right. Okay. I mean, I'm not, you know, I think people are more riveted than they are taking notes <laughs> and sending in comments. Uh, so um, among the three of you, I'm, you know, I'd like to open it up to your conversation. If you had thoughts and reflections uh, on, um, what was read and uh, commented on tonight. I took a couple of notes myself because, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sitting here with so much um, uh, talent and experience and, and um, I wanted to ask Lauren, where did you come across that? Uh, I, I don't speak French, so what is it, a blouson? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you come across that form? I mean, that is absolutely amazing. And I love form, you know, I, that's you, my thing. Right? I think you three form lovers in here. <laughs> absolutely yeah. love yeah. form. Yeah. Uh, and I was at a conference, I was at a conference at UVA and um, one of the speakers gave a, a talk on, uh, in which he referred to the blazon. I was like, oh, I, I don't know that one. <laughs> and uh, sort of looked it up and and it's, you know, on the one hand, it's sort of, you know, it's it's in it's in that, you know, not medieval, Renaissance sort of, you know, your eyes like the sun and you're, and it's sort of on and on and on about, and, and I just thought, oh, <laughs> But, you know, it's simile after simile after simile after simile. It's a litany of simile, really, you know. But, um, and then I thought, you know, I want to do something more interesting, <laughs> I, I hope, with, with that form. But, yeah, it's, it was a good, it was a good find. Yeah, it definitely is. Because immediately I was like, oh, my God, what can I do with that? What can I do with that, you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to thank you <laughs> for for um, teaching me uh, uh, something else. And the other thing that I was thinking about was the amount of research um, that you do, Marilyn, with your work. I I love I love research, um, and I think that. I love the research process almost as much as the writing process. So I was just wondering, you know, if you could talk more about, you know, just research in your work. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I, you said you love the research almost as much as, 
yeah, that's the problem. It's just, <laughs> it can take over your your creative life because it's so interesting. And uh, and it's hard to stop yourself. Um, and uh, I don't I don't know what else to say about it. I've well, can I hear, can I jump in and on, on, on payback on Antoinette's question because we've had this conversation about you know the research and the archives, and I'm curious about if there's a different relationship between um, you know you talked about the church sort of providing you this material and and versus like when do you see a gap and how do you know there's something to pursue mm -hmm. right and in, in research like I, i'm curious if there if it's different and if you can talk about like what what's the spidey sense that tells you ha 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 i should dig deeper here you know if it's not sort of handed over well that's inspiration though isn't it oh no that's what it my muse does not send me to the archives <laughs> Your, your muse doesn't send you to the archives. Oh, uh, you know, you're in there, you're in there. I don't remember uh, when I was doing family history and I remember a couple of times being at the National Archives in a, in a room full of people at computers looking up their genealogy and every once in a while somebody would say, ah! <laughs> Kind of, that's kind of like that. You know, you find something and there it is. It's just right there saying, turn me into a poem. I could be a poem, just choose me. Um, and uh, it's in some ways, it's a matter of, uh, of listening. I've done some really wonderful, for me, wonderful workshops with children in which they had been assigned research projects and I was supposed to come in and, and help them turn their research into poems and watching them discover how to find a voice in the research, in the information they had. You know, they had notes and it was, it was just a matter of finding a voice that could speak the information they had and it's hard to describe that but you know what it is when the voice appears there's there is a voice that that just announces that you have to listen that i i can't make it any any clearer uh yeah yeah that's interesting. I'm going to ask you about um, writing the now, right? Um, you have a Brianna Taylor poem, and you know Marilyn. Uh, I I was maybe going to read that poem I sent for you uh, for the poem a day, but you know I started writing that when Trayvon Martin was killed, and I finished it this year. <laughs> Um, and and you have a Brianna Taylor poem already, <laughs> and it's good. My Brianna Taylor poem is actually I was laughing because I pulled it up while, and it's sort of like I don't want to I don't want to write about Brianna Taylor, <laughs> and you know I sort of go through the resistance of it, and it just takes so long for me to get something that that is worth you know sort of sharing in any meaningful way but you know your poem is lovely and i'm curious about how, what's your what's your writing into that immediate uh, what's your process for doing that you know that's a that's a really great question because oftentimes i think you know we need time and space and things need to incubate and that has definitely been true for me on uh you know uh, about certain things. When um, my mother-in-law um, passed away, I wanted to write. It took me four years to find a way into that poem. And then one day I'm sitting under the hairdryer and the poem comes to me and the only thing I have are napkins. <laughs> and I start writing the poem that ends up being four pages long on napkins and then taking them back to the computer and sitting down and, and finally having something to work with. Um, when it came to um, my Trayvon Martin poem, um, I, and then I'll get to the Breonna Taylor poem. I wasn't really 
someone to write the now, like right in the moment. And I was just so torn up inside. And I walked into class um, to teach and my students were just sobbing. And I looked at one of my students and, and I said, what's wrong? You know, I, I mean, I knew, but I was like, you know, you know, why, what, what is making you weep now in this moment? And she said, my son is six. And uh, I knew she's counting off to when he's going to go from looking like a baby to suddenly, you know, looking like a threat. And the whole class ended up being about them discussing all of this. And so then later on that day, I went to go pick up my son, um, Thomas. Um, and he says, um, can you give my friend Bombs a ride home? That was his, you know, his nickname, Bombs. And I said, yeah. And he turns around and he says, Trayvon. And I was startled. I did not know that was his real name. And so he got in the car and we're driving and I look back and they're laughing and they're talking and those moments merge for me in that moment. And I'm just like, God, I wish I could just have the other Trayvon in my car laughing and talking and I could take him home to his mom, right? Um, so then when this, when Brianna Taylor you know, when all of that happened, <laughs> the whole, I, I said, you know what, there's going to be a lot of poems about Breonna Taylor's walls, you know, because, right, they're, they're the only thing that got any justice out of all of this, right, the walls. Um, but I was in a um, poetry workshop with Jericho Brown. And he had us with all of these different words, you know? And um, so he was asking us to the opposite of this word or what's the uh, synonym of this word. We ended up with like 72 different words. And out of that, this whole notion of something blowing up and blackness. And I thought, wow, um, what does it mean to be blown outside of yourself? Mm -hmm. To be asleep one moment and to be safe, to be startled out of a dream. And then the next thing you know, um, to go from that darkness, the darkness and joy of sleep, to the darkness and fear of what you see and to the darkness of forever. And then that was, that was the poem. And um, so I, I think what's happening now is that I'm so full of all of this stuff and I'm so alternately enraged and saddened and scared that I got to put it somewhere. And so that's why I'm having to write these poems in the now, yeah. That's a long answer. No, that was perfect. Wow. You know, we're all hurting. Um, I see people on Facebook every now and then say, you know, check on your black friends. They're not fine. And the truth of the matter is we aren't, you know? I'm, you know, you always see me smiling. I'm the happiest person in the world. I'm the most grateful person in the world. I, you know, have come a, a re real long way from, you know, having a, a very um, dysfunctional and abusive childhood to, you know, living my dream life, having my dream job, doing what I want to do every day, which is write poetry. Um, and, but I'm still, I'm still afraid. You know, if one of my kids calls me at a time that I do not think is a normal time somehow, my heart explodes before I even pick up the phone. I've had to stop myself from saying, is everything all right? Where are you? Because I'm like, 
my God, that's no way to answer the phone. <laughs> No way to live, really, right? Right. Just be, to be, be joyful. My God. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, babe. You know, then let me, you know, let them tell you what's going on. But yeah, I think um, I, 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 this is the other thing. And I got to remember that this isn't just the three of us, right? <laughs> this is going all over the world, whatever. Um, how can we be expected to be okay? Why are you so mad? Why are you angry? Think about it. You know, my little, my, my precious little boys aren't little boys anymore. They're big muscled, you know, black dudes. My daughter, you know, looks like Breonna Taylor, you know, and the fact that they're beautiful black women Right, living their life and smiling for the pictures. I actually um, did a, a digital uh, poem thing for a, a Network Humanities Digital Humanities event, and it was so funny. It was revelatory to me because I had this one. I had this one photo of Sandra Bland and her mother, and they were in a pose, and I had a photo of my sister and my mom in the same position. And it was that moment, and, you know, because I, you know, I, the question always becomes like, well, why this particular right. death, right? There's so many, you know, which is, is not to say, you know, but there, there, you know, but, and why? And am I falling into some media trap, right? But I think what the media sort of makes visible, we get that window into how similar and how close those lives are to ours, right? And, you know, I think of, of, of Sandra Bland sort of driving across the country to a new job. Well, I'm a person who, as we talked about, I move around all the time, you know, and yeah, I don't always use my blinkers, you know? So how is that, how is that a fatal error, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, but, you know, just seeing that image, that picture of Deborah and my mom and that picture of Sandra Bland, her mom and her middle name is Annette and my mother's name is Annette. And, and I was just like, oh my gosh, our, our interiors do so much work that we don't even know is happening. Uh, that is, is, you know, great, again, to put that in a poem, but also what are we holding, right? <laughs> what are we holding? And that, I think, therein lies the question. We are packed, all of that is packed in us. It's weighted on our shoulders, right? It's stuffed down in our gut. It's in the back of our minds, even when we're just, you know, I, I, I tried to tell my son about, you know, he has a son now of his own, but I, I, I was, um, I think I've used this with all three kids trying to explain to them, you know, what it's like to be a parent. And I said, you know, from the moment that you're born, there's the soft background music playing in the back of, you know, your head. And it's, you know, you and it's your siblings. And I brush my teeth, you know, and I go to work and I lecture and I lit, but all the time there's this music playing softly in the back of, you know, my head. It's like, they're never absent from you, right? And so the thought that they may be absent from you and you can't step in front of them to catch the bullet or you can't plead with the officer to put the gun away or whatever. You're somewhere flipping a pancake and your kid is out there somewhere. It's terrifying. It's, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. And now it's even more terrifying because I have a grandson. Yeah, I was gonna say, and it's more terrifying because it's, it's okay again to, to, to be the person who just gets rid of somebody because they don't like what they see. It's, just, yeah. it's yeah you know it's I wonder you know when oh I think this is a poem nobody steal this uh, <laughs> I was, that, yeah. <laughs> and no, everybody gets their notebooks out I was just gonna say when do black women sleep you know what okay I tell you what I turn it into a prompt everybody write the poem when do black women sleep <laughs> you know because it's it's like I would imagine we're tossing and turning and, and uh, dreaming dreams and dreaming nightmares on alternate nights, you know? And I think that's what it is to be um, 
a black mother or to be a mother who loves black children, right? Or to be a woman who loves black children because, um, you know, there are other women um, not of color who, who are raising and loving, um, genuinely loving black children too. And, um, you know, we're in this together, you know? Yeah. I think uh, just uh, to carry this back to the question of how you know in the archives, how do you know in history when you found something that is an opening into a poem, um, that, that, that has something to do with this too. You know when you recognize the truth of, of an experience and, and that the truth of that experience can happen. You can see it, you can feel it in any century, you know, you, um, pick, I, I had a, a semester in which I was teaching African-American women's slave narratives. And at the same time, I was doing a translation, a rendition of Euripides' tragedy, Hecuba, in which Hecuba is the queen of Troy and they've lost the war and the Greek women are gonna be taken off to Greece as slaves. That's what the whole play is about. So I would be reading these narratives and teaching them to the seminar. And then at night going back into ancient Greece and reading the same experience. It was uncanny and really was uncanny. I cried so much. I didn't, I thought something was wrong with my eyes because I couldn't read. My vision was clouded until I took my glasses off one day and realized that my glasses were covered with salt from tears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and well, finding our experiences in the experiences of the past, in the experiences of African-American women of the past. I feel also very strongly that, that our experiences are somehow paralleled in the experiences of native peoples mm -hmm. in this country. I mean, that it, they're not, only ours that we find something true about the nature of human beings, the potential of human beings to be incredibly cruel um, and yet to survive, you know, and yet to survive with hope and to keep creating art isn't that miraculous? It is miraculous. It is. It is. And um, I just wanted to. I, I. I. just wanted to say that um, you know we live. It was. I. I don't know if it was Antoinette or Lauren who said that. You know, it's always been terrifying, but it's more. These are more terrifying times. Someone had said that, and uh, I think this is true. This country has been founded on slavery, and it's a thoroughly racist society and now we have a genocidal racist in power a regime that will really stop at nothing you know to secure its power and it has an agenda which is you know misogynistic white supremacist and people are looking uh at a moment like this to artists to say what needs to be said at times like these and these are the words that you're uttering here, everyone, you know, all in all of these poems and taking that long view of history in this country. And Marilyn is talking about going back into ancient history. And, um, you know, and there is something about, you know, our common humanity and uh, the common oppression that people are facing in the world today. You know, it's, it's all stemming from a system 
that's based on exploitation of you know the domination of the few over the many and we're at this moment this critical moment right now in this society and uh that's a lot of what is motivating you know this 60 defiant days you know that um this is a kind of um a, a, a moment when uh, so much hangs in the scales and uh, the poets and the artists, you know, are needed in times like these, needed mm -hmm. to speak truth, to, to bring the power of language, you know, into the public square and for this to be amplified. And there is right now this, you know, this, this movement to drive this Trump-Pence regime from power and, uh, you know, I just was thinking, I just wanted to read one phrase from this pledge, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. The Trump-Pence regime must go. It says, you know, we do not comply with a regime putting targets on the backs of black, brown, and native people, denying women control of their bodies, forcing LGBTQ people back into the closet. We do not accept a society ruled by hate and bigotry, ignorance and brutality, demeaning and cursing other peoples and countries and threatening them with destruction. And it goes on to say, we will not worship the flag or accept a theocracy. We will not become collaborators on a march to a racist genocide. We will not hand the future, the scorchers of the planet. And here and now we pledge to unite in our millions rising together in nonviolent resistance to stop a great horror, we pledge to stay in the streets, overcoming fear and uncertainty until this American fascism is lost. And overcoming fear, finding the courage, that was a theme that I've heard in the poems tonight, you know, um, you know, and seeing ourselves as being connected, you know, in lives and through our language and through our images with something bigger than ourselves. So I just think this, you know, this has been a very and continues to be a very powerful and uh, poignant evening. And I just want to, you know, at this point, you know, once again, thank the poets uh, mm -hmm. for bringing, you know, all of this, you know, to us tonight and to share and to share with each other. And we are learning and, uh, you know, it's been a real very, very important experience for all of us. So I just wanted to take a few moments, if I could, to say uh, a few more words about Revolution Books and to call on people to support this bookstore, because tonight's program is testament to why, you know, this bookstore is so needed and so essential. And um, uh, I'm really, on behalf of the staff, calling on everyone in the viewing audience, we're counting on you to support Revolution Books, you know, and its critical work. You know, we like to say now that this is a very special resource. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a beacon for a whole new world at a time when this Trump-Pence fascism must be stopped. And, um, you know, this is a place that really values critical thinking, the poetic spirit and the struggle for the truth. It's a place where people come to grapple the way we're grappling with each other tonight, uh, to grapple to, with each other and to bring our insights and our questions, you know, to dig deeply into why the world is the hard is and how it can be changed, how it can be transformed through revolution. People bring their toughest questions and they bring, you know, their understanding and we, 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 we do this together to get the deepest understanding of things. And the beating heart of this bookstore is um, the work and leadership of Bob Avakian, who has developed um, and who is the architect of a whole new framework, a radically new framework for human emancipation. And this is called the New Communism. And this is the scientific method and approach to understand the world deeply in order to transform it radically, to make a revolution, to change everything, to emancipate all of humanity. And, you know, Marilyn was addressing the common experiences and threads, you know, among different peoples and sections of society. And we're looking at history and we are talking about 
a revolution to get beyond a society divided into oppressors and exploiters of, um, uh, ex excuse me, oppressors and the oppressed, exploiters and the exploited, and to put an end to all oppression. And um, that's what makes this bookstore so special. And you know, there's no revolution without the imagination, without the poetic spirit. We have to envision the future. And I heard, I, I think it was Marilyn in, in, was referencing earlier about planting saplings. And you know these are saplings of the future and they are saplings being planted in very troubled ground. And uh, this is the moment that we're at. Um, I wanted to let people know about some of our upcoming programs. We're very excited. We're gonna have um, on October 23rd, um, uh, we're gonna have uh, Anthea Butler, who is uh, a professor of religious studies at University of Pennsylvania. She had um, uh, co-initiated uh, the scholars strike that took place in early September at universities all over the country. People were holding uh, special classes, no business as usual to address you know, the burning issues of the day, Black Lives Matter, the destruction of the ecology of the planet. She is gonna be speaking on October 23rd here um, on the theme of scholars and activism. So we're looking forward to that. And then um, we're going to have Martina Spada, uh, the great Puerto Rican poet. He's gonna be doing a special program. It's called Martin Espada, Poet of the Political Imagination. So he's gonna be here on uh, October 27th. And um, we are setting in place a number of other programs. One of the more interesting ones, I mean, they're all interesting, but this is uh, something that uh, you don't get to see. And here, I emphasize here every day, and that is we're gonna have a cello concert uh, outside um, uh, in San Francisco. It's gonna be an open air cello concert. Uh, and it's uh, it's going to be a performance of a classical piece by an African American composer. So um, that's what's in the offing, and uh, this is why we need your support. You can donate at revolutionbooksnyc.org. You can do it through Venmo at Rev Books R E V Books N Y C, and you can do it at Cash App, which is the dollar sign Rev Books. Uh, NYC and people should donate, they can become a sustainer. And uh, these funds are going to enable Revolution Books to promote and project this 60 defiant days so we can have larger audiences and we want to maximize the impact of these events, help us recover from the shutdown during the pandemic. We've opened both the New York and the San Francisco stores have opened for, uh, you know, uh, limited hours, limited days, we're complying with the health restrictions, and we want to restock our shelves with the books that matter. So I call on everyone, you know, to support, you know, this, this indispensable resource and let other people know about Revolution Books. Put us on your Instagram, tell your friends and colleagues, and also get in touch with us with your ideas, because we count on you for your support, for your involvement, for your energy, and for your creativity. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, by way of bringing people into the House of Revolution books, and we really appreciate um, all of what uh, we've heard tonight and experienced tonight. And I was, you know, wondering if maybe um, each of our poets would like to make a last comment or read a last verse. Uh, to say uh, good night. So, you know, uh, if there's a poem that everyone would like to read, that would be great. If there's something people would like to say, that would be welcome. Um, so uh, if you are so moved, but we have been moved by you. So I just want to thank you again. And if uh, we want to do a little round robin, that would be great. Um, if not, it's been a wonderful evening. So um, I, I want to close, well, not close, but I do want, I have one poem I saved because I started with Gretel and I wanted to read a Gretel poem. Great. Uh, which is um, Gretel's note on normal. I only wrote two things this whole pandemic and both of them were in Gretel's voice. Gretel's note on normal. 
you want, I know, to go back to normal, that distant sepia sweet place your memory has touched up with erasure and longing, I know. I can tell you how in the hell of the cottage, that kidnapping come quarantine, all I could think of was home. I drew the blanket of the familiar over my days and dreams, wept when the new reality of my life poked me with its bony finger, ordered me to rise and cook all of it a cage I could not break. When at last I bested the witch and found her treasures, my future gleaming possible in my hands, I chose to run back to what I remembered. I write to you now from that place, which is to say I would go to that girl heaving with relief and remind her that she was no lost sheep, but a lamb sent to the slaughter. I would tell her that the sacrificed are not meant to survive the cut, that return is another word for re-wounding. I would tell her she has been sharpening the formidable weapon of her mind, that her hands can build as well as burn. Forget normal and back and happily ever after. I would say to her, imagine otherwise. Thank you for tonight. That was absolutely amazing and the perfect way to um, go out. Um, I'll read a quick poem. I think the one thing, the one comment I'd like to leave with is we have to find our way back to civility somehow. You know, nothing's gonna get better unless we can actually sit down and have some type of conversation um, and, and I think that we need to also remember um, that the children are watching, right? Um, this poem is from Icarus in Love. Um, it has echoes of Gwendolyn Brooks and uh, Yehuda Amachai in it. It's called Welcoming the Night. Brambly fingers escort the night across screaming skies, while the quiet moon, flawless as a baby's rose fingernails, bears the lament of the worthy poor, whose pained cries are reminiscent of melody fleeing from a flautist's mouth over broken glass. Behind all this, some great happiness is hiding. Yes, some great happiness is hiding perhaps in the children, yes, in the children. Happiness is hiding in the children. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Th that was wonderful. And uh, I have, oh, oh, it, it seems to me that the one thing that we need to hold right now is the hope that what seems to be the incredibly ugly face of this country and this country's history can somehow be redeemed. We, whether, is it possible that democracy, the ideal we believed we were built on can survive? Is democracy really possible? Um, we keep, telling each other to vote. Uh, can we believe in that now? The people in this awful administration are trying to make us not believe. And yeah, so I'm gonna read a poem. It's just a description of something that happened to me about 
50 years ago. Um, it's called Minor Miracle, which reminds me of another knock on wood memory. I was cycling with a male friend through a small Midwestern town. We came to a four way stop and stopped chatting. As we started again, a rusty old pickup truck, ignoring the stop sign, hurricaned past scant inches from our front wheels. My partner called, hey, that was a four-way stop. The truck driver, stringy blonde hair, a long fringe under his brand name beer cap, looked back and yelled, you fucking niggers, and sped off. My friend and I looked at each other and shook our heads. We remounted our bikes and headed out of town. We were pedaling through a clear blue afternoon between two fields of almost ripened wheat bordered by cornflowers and Queen Anne's lace when we heard an unmuffled motor, a honk honking. We stopped, closed ranks, made fists. It was the same truck. It pulled over. A tall, very much in shape young white guy slid out. Greasy jeans, homemade finger tattoos, probably a Marine Corps boot camp footlocker full of martial arts techniques. What did you say back there? He shouted. My friend said, I said it was a four way stop. You went through it. And what did I say? The white guy asked. You said, you fucking niggers. The afternoon froze. Well, said the white guy, shoving his hands into his pockets and pushing dirt around with the pointed toe of his boot. I just want to say I'm sorry. He climbed back into his truck and drove away. I just want to say that this happened and that miracles are very unlikely. They're impossible. But there's always hope that people can come, can change, that people can turn around and realize they've been crazy. They've been stupid. They've made terrible mistakes. And maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's possible that change can happen. It's not likely. It may require major miracle. But if we don't hope, then how do we go on? And one of the things that I think art poetry makes possible is that it opens the space inside us where that seed might grow. And if it can grow in us, then maybe it can grow in other people. And that's why we have books <laughs> and bookstores. <laughs> okay, I want to thank Marilyn. I want to thank Antoinette. I want to thank Lauren for a wonderful evening. And uh, to those of you in the audience, you experienced something very special. Uh, this is going to be archived so people can watch it again. And uh, we want to have everyone back. And we want to have you back in the brick and mortar setting in the bookstore and um, spread the word. And this is um, one of our 60 days of defiance from Revolution Books. And I thank all of you for contributing to a beautiful and powerful and poignant evening.